My name is Sean Casey. I'm the director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs here at Georgetown University. And it's my distinct pleasure to moderate this session. I cannot think of two more qualified contemporary theological thinkers to talk about the legacy of John Courtney Murray and the role of public theology today than the, the two scholars we have with us. I'm going to introduce both of them at this point, and then uh, Father Hare is going to speak first, and, and then Robin will, will follow him. And we want to, uh, again, share a question and answer period with those of you in the audience. I, I think we'll have a very robust discussion uh, based on their comments. Uh, I have a deep personal attachments to, to both of these gentlemen. Uh, is, uh, in the Casey family, it's known that, that Father Hare saved my academic neck more, on more than one occasion. Uh, he was my doctoral dissertation advisor. Uh, and it's always good to say that about your thesis advisor rather than that they ended your academic career. Uh, but it, it is a great delight and joy to have Brian with us. Uh, Robin finished, uh, I think, your dissertation in the late 70s, and I arrived at Harvard Divinity School soon after that, and, and yours was one of the first dissertations I read at the instruction of, of Preston Williams. So uh, there's a, a lot of history here, a, a lot of deep thought. Brian Hare is currently the Parker Gilbert Montgomery Professor of the Practice of Religion and Public Life at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. He's also the Secretary of Health and Social Services in the Archdiocese of Boston. He was born in Lowell, Massachusetts, and grew up nearby in Chelmsford, Massachusetts. Father Hare was ordained as a priest of the Archdiocese of Boston in 1966. In 1977, he earned his Doctor of Theology from Harvard Divinity School. His teaching and research focus on ethics and foreign policy and the role of religion and moral politics and in American society is at the core of his intellectual life. He has served as president of Catholic Charities USA from 1984 to 1992. Father Hare was Joseph P. Kennedy Professor of Ethics at the School of Foreign Service here at Georgetown. From 1973 to 1992, he directed the Office of International Affairs in, at, the, at the then Department of Social and Political Affairs at the U.S. Catholic uh, Conference of Bishops. During this time, he was the chief author of the U.S. Bishops' 1983 pastoral letter, The Challenge of Peace, focused on the nuclear age. He's the author of numerous policy statements uh, uh, for the Bishops' Conference and uh, for individual bishops and for Catholic institutions. Father Hare has been a recognized public theologian for many, many decades. Robin Lovin was the William Scheide Senior Fellow at the Center of Theological Inquiry in Princeton, New Jersey until very recently. And he remains the Kerry McGuire University Professor of Ethics Emeritus at Southern Methodist University. He is now a visiting scholar at Lo in uh, Loyola University in Chicago's theology department. Um, he's been a resident, he was, as I said, he was a resident scholar at CTI uh, beginning in 2012 and finished that term very recently. He became a member of the SMU uh, Perkins School of Theology faculty in 1994, and then he served as dean of the Perkins School of Theology from 94 through 2002. He's recognized uh, for his expertise on Reinhold Niebuhr's Christian realism, social ethics, and church-state interactions. His most recent books are Christian Realism in the New Realities, 2008, and An Introduction to Christian Ethics, 2011. He has also written extensively on religion and law and comparative religious ethics. He is a former Guggenheim Fellow, former president of the Society of Christian Ethics, and a member of the advisory board for the McDonald Center for Theology, Ethics, and Public Life at Oxford University. So uh, Father Hare is going to speak first, and then Robin, and we may have some conversations amongst the three of us, but we want to quickly pivot to the audience for Q&A. So please join me in welcoming uh, Brian Hare. Thank you. Thank you very much. I deeply appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think Georgetown provides a unique and fitting place to think about John Courtney Murray as he was and John Courtney Murray's thought as it exists today. When I first received the title of this session, Public Theology uh, and its Meaning Today, 
you might say my prima facie reaction to the title was the following. My understanding of public theology is the use of explicitly theological language and reasoning in the church's address to public policy questions. So I stopped there with that definition, which may be too narrow. Because my first reaction was, I don't think Murray ever used the term public theology, to my knowledge. Secondly, I also thought, maybe without foundation, that if he was asked to examine it, his response might be less than enthusiastic. So why did I feel that way? Obviously, Murray was a theologian, fundamentally a theologian, a systematic theologian. But he produced major contributions to the social teaching of the church and the public life of the church in the United States. But the question of how one addresses the public life of a secular society and how one speaks as a church, both to the church itself and to the wider society, is part of this dispute about the meaning of public theology. As you know, P Murray talked often about public philosophy. He also had theological grounding for all that he addressed, as Francisca indicated, in terms of natural law and the shaping of the consensus or the attempt to shape the consensus of a secular society. So without sort of trying to dissect the topic of public theology in Murray's own work or today, my remarks will focus on what his legacy is in terms of either public philosophy or public theology. So I would like to address three things. One, Murray's premises. Secondly, the structure of his argument on selected issues. Thirdly, his conclusions, as they were then and as they may be seen now. Now, to elaborate these three things adequately would take more time than I have. So what I'm doing is to talk about the premises and then collapse my comments on the structure of his arguments and his conclusions, which gives me, I hope, an opportunity to expose his thought and to say something about it. Murray's premises, the premise by premises by which he addressed public policy issues. The first, he affirmed again and again the bipolar structure of religion and political authority. This was his fundamental proposition all the way through the articulation of the historical arguments on church and state and religious liberty. And it was his approach to how one should address a wider secular society, the bipolar structure of religion and political authority. Bipolar, he did not use the word, he called it diarchy. The bipolar meaning is that there, it, there is a mutual recognition of two societies in any public arena. Two societies, two authorities, two laws. And so religious authority speaks and civil authority speaks. Civil society exists and the church exists in civil society as a complement to it. And there is both church law and civil law. This bipolar structure is at the heart of how he addresses the public arena. It recognizes and preserves, I would argue, the secularity of the state, the secularity, legitimate secularity of civil authority. And on the other hand, it protects space for the life and role of the religious voice and the religious community, what Murray often called the freedom of the church. This bipolar structure sets limits on both religious authority and civil authority, and it resists any collapse of the two. This was his fundamental point about interpreting the European in conception of religious freedom and the American conception. It resists any collapse of either church into state or the state into the church. 
That was his first premise, the bipolar structure of religion and politics. Secondly, his second premise, I think, was the necessity for the church to understand and play a public role and to exercise that role in both its teaching and public advocacy. Here is where the question of the public address comes up, not the theological foundations of the church's public address. He clearly was interested in that, advocated it, and spoke about it. But the public address to state and society. This is where he turned more often, I think, to public philosophy. The language of reason, the uh, in articulation, as Francisca made the point clearly, of a natural law of vision by which the church would speak to the society. And so the second uh, point is while you distinguish the two authorities, there is a necessity for the church to be what Martin Marty called a public church. He was never bashful about that. The language he espoused, I would argue, is primarily the language of public philosophy, grounded in a theological concern, but expressed in a way that opens the discourse so that those who do not share the church's faith may find wisdom in its moral teaching. The final premise I find in his work is more methodological, but an important point that he wrote about, but briefly. Murray's argument was that when the church addressed public issues, what he called the questio facti should precede the questio juris. What he means by that is that when you do moral theology or Christian ethics, you first have to be sure you understand the nature of the secular problem before you address it in moral terms. This is a disciplining argument about how the church should go about, or any religious community should go about its work. The bipolar structure of authority, the necessity for the church to be a public church, and the necessity for the questio facti to be satisfied before the questio juris, the normative question, is offered. In summary, I think these premises sought to protect space for the church, asserted an obligation for the church to be publicly involved, and then thought about how the church should both set its own belief, speak to its own community, where theology obviously is part of the discourse, but how the church should speak to the public order. So how did those premises then relate to his structure of argument on selected issues? The bipolar structure of his argument shapes his contribution to the range of church-state religious liberty questions. I have two comments about that part of his work. On the one hand, his, his literature, writings, advocacy, speaking, and role as a theologian in the United States and at Vatican II. His writing and teaching on this, uh, his writing and teaching on democracy and Catholicism have stood the test of time very well. His arguments are still the gold standard, I would argue, for how we are to understand democracy and Catholicism, church and state, religious and political authority. So there's no question, I think, that on that topic, he is what the classical moral theologians used to call a, a, an authority by himself. In other words, his own opinions were so respected that he didn't need other supporters to have him recognized as a standard authority. Secondly, you can then ask whether his work touches everything that we have before us today, where church and state, religion and politics intersect. So let me indicate one case where, and how I think he might have handled it. It's a case that's rather present tense and has been with us in a rather confused way, I think, for the last four or five years. It was the case on the Affordable Care Act and the so-called contraceptive mandate that was included in the Affordable Care Act. How would Murray have responded to that question? 
I think on the one hand, Murray would not have resisted the inclusion of contraceptive services in any health care plan designed for this secular pluralistic society. Secondly, on the other hand, his concern, his constant concern for what can be called the freedom of the church would have led him, I think, to at least resist in principle the argument that church agencies had to be agents in the distribution of contraceptives because of the in principled Catholic position on contraception. On the other hand, thirdly, having taken a position to protect the freedom of the church, I do not think, to be honest, that you would have found him on the front steps of the Supreme Court beside the Little Sisters of the Poor. I think then he would have thought that while you could contest the case for the freedom of the church, the church ought not to, re not, ought not to risk the provision of health care in principle for all the citizens of this society. Those three steps, I think, are the kind of dissection that he used to go through in arguing a case. Secondly, let me take a different case, Murray on social and economic issues. Murray on political issues, as I say, is a standard authority. He, very li he wrote very little, to my knowledge at least, on what we might call social economic issues. One of the places he did was in We Hold These Truths, where as part of a chapter, he deals with the American economic system. Here, the treatment is very brief and I think totally inadequate. So on his treatment of economics, Murray doesn't meet his own standard of the questio facti, questio juris. His description of the American economic system is kind of a pay-on, uh, uh, constantly uh, positive in terms of what the system has produced. There are reasons to praise the American economic system, but there are reasons to criticize it. He never reaches that point, and to my knowledge, that is the only place where he dealt with this issue. So his structure of argument there, I think, was clearly inadequate. It did not meet his own test. Thirdly, Murray on foreign policy. Here you return to a field where Murray brought classical theological philosophical argument to bear on empirical complexity. Because you see, empirical complexity, of course, is the reason why he uses his measured judgment that the questio facti must precede the questio juris. He talks about amateur moralists making broad statements uh, and coming to quick conclusions. Uh, and he quickly dissects them because of failure to grasp uh, the notion of the questio juris. Indeed, when he talks about moral analysis and public policy, he argues that this indeed is an appropriate place for the church, a necessary place for the church. But he says when you go about the moral analysis of public policy, he puts it this way. Moral argument must grasp the nature of politics, the due autonomy of the political, the limiting factors of political action, the standing of success as a political value. Those are all tests that you put to any conclusion about public policy and ethics. Does it adhere to those standards? Or does it overreach without sufficient analysis to support the conclusion? When Murray turned to foreign policy, he was at home. He was at home in foreign policy generally and at home on war and peace. That did not mean that he wrote often on these questions. Indeed, in the one conversation I had with him before I went to graduate school, uh, one of the things I asked him was about these two articles he wrote in America Magazine, which then became part of We Hold These Truths. And they were uh, arguments about ethics and foreign policy, and to some degree arguments about his differences with Reinhold Niebuhr without ever naming Niebuhr. And so I asked him about the articles. He said, look, I wrote those articles with my left hand. 
because nobody else in the Catholic Church was commenting on this debate. Well, that just goes to show that Murray's left hand are better than most of us with both hands. But, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that uh, those articles are an example of how he tried to fulfill a combination of normative depth and empirical modesty about questions. How did he think about foreign policy? Murray, I think, brought a realist conception to foreign policy. Now, by saying that, I don't want to label him too quickly, and I have an expert on this field coming right after me. But my point is, he, he did not fit nicely into the schools of foreign policy analysis. He was neither, neither a classical realist nor a classical liberal, the two major schools of international relations theory. But Murray did bring, I would argue, a realist stance in his own distinctive way. It was realist grounding, but it was realist vision combined with constant normative analysis, precisely the question that the classical realists oftentimes don't pay attention. Murray was realist in the sense that he accepted the role of sovereign states, but not absolute sovereignty. He accepted the reality of the international community and argued that there ought to be provided for it an appropriate juridical structure, a normative statement that is ahead of both realism and liberalism. And his argument was that in, in shaping the international community, what we had done in domestic communities is a model, but not easily accomplished when you move to foreign policy. Now, an example of his realism, and, the, uh, and as he described it, the moral direction of power in world politics, in, as an example of that, take his treatment on the use of force. He argues on the one hand that force is inherent in world politics and that any analysis factually of world politics without power was insufficient. He and Niebuhr had their arguments about how you classified power, but there was no doubt about it. States, power, complexity all marked his approach to questions of foreign policy and the use of force. His article on war and peace, of course, is dated in its empirical analysis, but one can draw from it his fundamental assertions. They are kind of lapidary statements of the role of force and its appropriate nature in world politics. So he argues that the threefold function of the church in approaching war and peace is to condemn war as evil, to limit the evil it entails, and to humanize its conduct transfer that into a theory, it is the just war argument. And he was a voice for that in that argument, in that article in theological studies. Finally, his conclusions in this area, I think he provides one of the best arguments for the abiding necessity for the church to have a place for the legitimate use of force in international politics, given the world as it is. I think, secondly, his treatment of nuclear weapons in that article was, is today inadequate. For his time, he was part of an emerging consensus that tended to elide from conventional to nuclear weapons too quickly. His posture can't stand today. And his dismissal, real, really dismissal, of the idea of nonviolence and pacifism in terms of the Catholic community is not adequate today, given the development in theological ethics about pacifism and nonviolence. I do not think it replaces the just war. I do think it has a comparable, indeed complementary, role in the larger picture of how the church addresses war and peace. So Murray tried to be faithful to his own standards. He didn't always meet those standards, but none of us really do if you set the standards as well as he did. But what he did do for us in terms of premises and structure of argument, I think is a contemporary guide for the life of the church.
in its public role. Thank you. Well, it, it was, as it turns out, almost 40 years ago now that I skipped my Harvard PhD commencement to go to Milwaukee and participate in a symposium on the unfinished agenda of John Courtney Murray. John Coleman and Brian Hare were the other two panelists in that session, and David Hollenbach edited it for publication in Theological Studies. And I almost called Brian to suggest we could save ourselves some preparation time <laughs> <laughs> by just unearthing those essays and reading them again. His, uh, uh, the, that is John Courtney Murray's agenda remains unfinished, but we do owe to him some basic questions that continue to shape our agenda. And uh, Brian has just summarized some of those very concretely uh, in an important way. At the same time, a lot has changed. It changed already in the decade between his death and that meeting in Milwaukee in 1978. And the changes between now and 1960, when We Hold These Truths was published, is, is even more important. The second, in, in 1960, the Second Vatican Council had only just been called. It hadn't actually met. The mass movement that changed civil rights law and race relations and arguably the relationship between religion and society in the United States was just getting underway. Murray, of course, became part of that in his role as director of the Lafarge Institute. Perhaps more importantly, in for the intellectual questions we're raising here, in 1960, neither Robert Bella's essay on civil religion in America nor John Rawls' A Theory of Justice had been published. And one might add, in relation to some of the discussions we've already had today, the Protestant rethinking of natural law that Paul Ramsey was uh, in, responsible for in such important ways really had not begun. So we begin with a set of assumptions about these questions that weren't even available to Murray uh, when he wrote the, We Hold These Truths. And one of the things that I think Barry Huddock's uh, study does so well for us is show the way that Murray's thinking for all that it was on the progressive edge of Catholic thought was deeply rooted in the controversies of the 1940s and 1950s. So it's not surprising then that we, we have to think again about the meaning of uh, Murray's agenda for our times. So what do we owe to Murray and what has changed? Notably, we owe to Murray the basic question of whether there is a public consensus or an American proposition. He never assumes the existence of the social and intellectual frameworks that he wants to review from a Catholic perspective. He constructs those for his readers and not simply as straw men that he can knock down but with profound respect for the ideas and traditions and thinkers, even when he intends to call them into question. He understands that the questions he is raising are not about numbers or interest or power, but part of a civil argument. And the price of admission to that argument is showing that you understand the case that your interlocutor is making. Murray clearly had the price of admission to that kind of civil argument. The question today is whether there would be anyone to take his ticket. The question of fact versus the, the question of uh, the, the quasio juris, you, you know, the, we don't get public discussions today that really start with that question of fact. Public argument now, whether in the media or even, I fear, in academic theology, is almost exclusively about mobilizing people who already agree with you 
and directing their thinking toward a more consistent and comprehensive ideological position. It helps in that task if you can convince yourself and your hearers that there are no good arguments for the other side, that those who oppose you are motivated by self-interest or false consciousness so that the arguments they make cannot be their real reasons, even if they seem to believe those reasons. You will know what our opponents think when I tell you what their real reasons are. The candidates and the commentators all say, don't be misled by the reasons they give you. So the framework of the public consensus seems more shaky today than it was 50 or 60 years ago. And the difference in our situation implies some difference for the role of the public theologian. But I want to I, I want to highlight two of those differences, which I'll get to in a minute, but I want to begin by emphasizing what I think Murray got right that is still right for our situation. Murray believed that within the framework of public argument in a free society, the work of the public theologian is to bring the resources and convictions of the Christian tradition to bear on that argument in order to shape the public choices. This is not a matter of imposing religious authority, but it is about winning the argument. The Catholic tradition has an important contribution to make in, in Murray's account, precisely because it offers an enduring, comprehensive, and how shall I put it, Catholic view of the human condition that illuminates and sets in context the more particular questions that are the subject of public argument. After the Second Vatican Council, Murray might have added that Catholics are good at this precisely because they have a long experience with a body of doctrine that develops in relation to changing conditions without losing its unity and identity. It's not hard to see the connection between what Murray calls the growing end of the public consensus in We Hold These Truths and his ideas about the development of doctrine that made possible the Declaration on Religious Freedom. A public consensus and the body of Catholic truth are not the same thing. They're not even the same kind of thing. Uh, Brian's point about bipolar authority here is, is very much to the point. But those who have a care for the public can identify with and learn from the skills that theologians use to ensure that fidelity to the literal message does not contradict the proclamation of the faith or create stumbling blocks to its hearing. Paradoxically, these skills ensure peace because they keep the argument going. It's the attempts to end the argument, whether by force or by logic, that lead to polarization or to smoldering resentments that break out into civic wildfires at some later point. So Murray's understanding of the public argument and the ways that theologians contribute to it remains relevant despite the large differences between 1960 and today. The question is how to restate his case in our context I want to try to do that briefly on two points that I hope will create some space for further discussion. In the spirit of John Courtney Murray, I will pose these two points as questions the way he did in the four unfinished arguments section of We Hold These Truths. So first question, is it good? This is a question that the public theologian has to pose to theorists of liberal democracy who have reconstructed the public argument since Murray wrote half a century ago. That reconstruction was a necessary task as Murray himself I think would have acknowledged. Remember that he talked about two cases for a public consensus. There's the case that treats it as a fact and that fails. And then there's the case that treats the public consensus as a need 
so that the person who wants to enter an argument about law or policy or national security must subtly create the framework in which the argument can go on in order to state the normative case that you want to make. Murray did this himself in relation to a wide range of sources, as well as in perceptive readings of his contemporaries in economics and political thought. But the resources available to him were actually pretty thin compared to the explosion of political theory that began just a few years later. Remember the inventory I gave you a few minutes ago of, of uh, Paul Ramsey and John Rawls and Robert Bella, Martin Luther King's beloved community. Each in its own way validates Murray's conviction that a public consensus in 1960 was more of a need than a fact, the, that, that those arguments had to be made in the 1970s. Uh, it suggests that, that we didn't have so much of a public consensus in the 1960s. But each of those alternative accounts poses its own questions to Murray's way of constructing the public consensus. Perhaps the most important of these questions is whether there can be public discussion of the human good and the goods that are essential to it. Murray's natural law tradition, of course, assumes that such discussion is possible and necessary. Much of liberal theory since Murray calls this into question. Consider, for example, John Rawls' thin theory of the good, which argues that a liberal democracy can construct its political principles around a very minimal account of human nature, and that indeed it must avoid more specific appeals to the human good, since that leads to divisions and disagreements that can't be resolved. The public consensus about the good, then, will always be limited and contested, and those who want to make public arguments must learn to rely on principles that don't take us beyond the thin theory. Robert Audi's close rela closely related case that the terms of public argument must be accessible to everyone without special appeals to tradition or religious authority or revelation uh, is a, a similar point. Likewise, Isaiah Berlin's less formal argument that human goods are irreducibly multiple and conflicted and organized into no comprehensible order. All of those accounts of the good tend to minimize the usefulness of appeals to human good and goods in public argument. And there is practical wisdom behind these theories. There's a wariness about the risks of intolerance and conflict that is deeply rooted in modern political thought. Murray certainly understood that and understood the importance of the freedom of conscience and of religious liberty. In a time when intolerance and intimidation are powerful forces in politics, the public theologian needs to speak up for freedom of thought and freedom of speech. But where those conditions are met, and where the political argument is well underway, there is surely also a place for the question I think Murray would ask, which is, is it good? What vision of human flourishing does a particular course of action imply? And what claims does this good make against the other goods and the resources that would be required to realize it? A thin theory of the good will either leave those questions unanswered or insist that the claims of the good extend only to the minimal requirements of survival and human dignity. An Augustinian understanding of the human good will insist that if public argument means anything, it has to be able to take on more complex claims about the good than a thin theory allows. So that's Murray's first question, I think, that he would, would offer to our discourse today, is it good? Liberal theorists, of course, might hear Murray pose that and reply, that's exactly what we were afraid of. <laughs> 
that in an era of global religious extremism and religious polarization, we will have to, we, the, the people who make that argument about the good, have to concede that their point has more relevance today than it might have seemed when they first raised it in the work of Rawls and Audi and others in the last quarter of the 20th century. The liberal theorists, especially Audi, aren't hostile to religion and don't want to exclude Christian thought from public discussion, but they're worried with some good evidence that religious people tend to enter these discussions with the conviction that they already have the answers and with a corresponding willingness to impose those answers on others who happen to be so unfortunate as not to know for sure what they believe. John Rawls called these systems of belief comprehensive doctrines. He acknowledged that a lot of people hold them and that they're unlikely to disappear, but he thought the task of a liberal democracy is to make sure they not, do not become part of political life. So let's give these theorists their own question in the unfinished agenda. If we allow the public theologian to ask, is it good? Let's also allow the secular critic to ask, is it politics? That is, are we here within the realm of contingent truths that might be otherwise, where shared experience and evidence are important and all solutions are imperfect and subject to what Reinhold Niebuhr called the irony of history? Are we, is, is that the, the argument we're trying to enter and conduct rather than an argument about doctrine? One effect of the deterioration of our public discourse over recent decades, as I said, is that party programs have taken on a kind of ideological rigidity that makes them invulnerable to criticism or refinement. If there is no growing in to the public argument, no place where we're figuring out new solutions to changing problems, then the task of political leadership, as I suggested a minute ago, becomes to mobilize the base, to reinforce core convictions, and hope that intimidation or indifference will lead those who think differently to just stay home on election day. In that sense, uh, the, the liberal theorists who raise the question whether we're really engaging in politics or just some kind of ideological purification raise an important question. And we have to admit, too, that there is a theological counterpart to those polarized politics in which the theologian proclaims that Christian truth is basically incomprehensible to those who do not share it. Understandably, there's a little confusion among these theologians about what we're supposed to do about that. Some seem to hope for a restoration of a unified Christian worldview, or at least want to talk about what the world would be like if such a restoration were achieved. Others, ironically, want to claim the protections of liberal religious liberty to ensure that they can live according to the requirements of their Christian faith in a society that does not share it. And still others, perhaps most consistently, suggest withdrawal into communities of Christian identity. Murray raised questions about the modern understanding of politics, and he certainly faced critics who thought his Catholic tradition was incompatible with democracy. But I think he saw politics as a vocation, as a lo locus for Christian service rather than a locus of Christian truth. He never read Rawls' theory of justice, let alone the later works in which Rawls tried to accommodate the comprehensive doctrines. But I think Murray would ask, whether the very idea of a comprehensive doctrine is not itself a reaction to the restriction of talk about human goods. Whether the notion of a comprehensive doctrine doesn't violate that bipolar notion of authority that Brian talked about so, so clearly. 
Christian traditions and perhaps religious traditions generally are full of fine distinctions between the temporary and the eternal, between the secular and the religious. Rather than the thin theory of the good being a practical restraint on the excessive claims of comprehensive doctrines, it seems to me that public theologians might be suggesting that the comprehensive doctrine is itself a creation of the thin theory of the good. Nevertheless, I think Murray would understand and sympathize with the concerns that lead secular theorists to make such proposals. Fifty years after his death, I like to picture the spirit of John Courtney Murray still catching cabs or waiting in airports, dashing perhaps between the Berkeley Center here in Georgetown and First Things in New York, always asking, is it good and is it politics? but asking each question most insistently in the place where he thinks it'll make the audience feel most uncomfortable. Thank you. Let, let me ask the two of you, do you have questions or responses for to each other? Very good. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think we, we, we could write these up in a way in which they were one uh, paper. Yeah. His involving a lot more knowledge of Murray than mine does, but uh, it's... Well, there, there, was a, there was an article way back when, when John Rawls must have been an assistant professor, Murray did an article called The Problem with Mr. Rawls's Problem. Ah, and ah. so that discussion was an early, early version okay. of the point that, yeah. that you have made. Uh, I, I, I mean, I guess my sense is that, um, in, in a sense, and I think you've made this point, um, the underlying, almost presumed consensus of a Protestant culture that was true from the colonial era up through the 1950s, was able to sustain the possibility of more discussion across religious and philosophical lines. That what one accepted as sort of a given for American society was just there, and then you could build upon your differences, if you will, and discuss them. Uh, I think your point is that has come apart greatly in different ways, including the increasing secularity. Uh, I mean, I always worry when religious traditions assault the secular. I think the secular is not a term that is inimicable to faith and religion. But Murray was clear that you protect the secular, but you fight secularism, and he did that consistently. Today, that's a tougher role. I mean, if you look at the courts, for the most part, if you look at the academy, if you look at the rising, uh, the fastest rising religious group in American society, the knowns, all of that leads to a, 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 a more narrow conception of what the role of religion uh, is uh, presumed to have, not from the religious point of view, but from the audience you're trying to speak to. Well, let me, let me ask one question, then we'll, we'll pivot to the audience. In the State Department, it was very interesting that uh, when there would be a, a hot issue, uh, some emerging foreign policy issue, uh, and I, I tried to, to educate my staff to look for this because it, it, I think it was really true, uh, we would get correspondence or communication from the, the, the bishops' conference. And there would be a grasp. So the, 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 Murray, the Murray framework you outlined w was there. There would be a grant. You knew the staff of the conference knew the empirical facts of an issue. Now, you, you, might, you might disagree on the margins, but at least they came in, and you could have a discussion about the facts. And then they would, would pivot to the moral uh, normative arguments based on that. Uh, when the Protestants would come in, uh, it, you would just, it was the wild, wild west. Uh, that, you know, the grasp of the empirical ranged from very astute to just impossible to identify. Uh, and it would quickly pivot to the normative. And it would often be undermined by its lack of empirical veracity. So how, it, 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 
that was my experience on the inside. And, and so I, I think that the Murray framework, you still see that uh, coming from, from Catholic sources. On the Protestant side, uh, it was rarer. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't invisible, but it was rarer. How do we, how do different Christian traditions try to recover that and preserve it in, in the contemporary setting? Or is that even possible? I mean, I, I, it, it's it's very difficult because, as I was trying to say, the, I mean, the 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 whole tenor of political argument now is seems to me to be about rallying and and a base and giving it some ideological consistency. Uh, and the, uh, the question of whether there's a body of fact back there behind it is 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 not uh, so much in consideration. I think what's really important for our ecclesiastical institutions is that they, de they develop an interdisciplinary discussion about this. Uh, all church bodies have lay members who are authorities you know, on, these, on these factual questions. I think it's it's particularly characteristic of Protestants these days that they don't pay attention to that. So, so basic uh, uh, attempt to frame your your uh, discussion in interdisciplinary terms that would be recognized by people who were talking about these problems in general. But. I mean, part of the question that you can speak to much better than I is that, you know, as I understand it, when the Pew Foundation now does polling of, of religious groups, there are two kinds of Protestants. Oh, yes. <laughs> so the question coming into the State Department may depend upon what sector of the Protestant community it comes from in terms of how much attention is paid to the empirical dimension and what kind of transition is made for an empiric, from an empirical analysis to a normative analysis. And my guess is, and I think to some degree, obviously this is always counterpointed with the evangelicals and the mainline, and to some degree I think at times there's an unfairness of the critique of the, of the evangelicals because they split out into different mm -hmm. groups mm -hmm. and there's sophisticated analysis in the Protestant evangelical community, but not always. But then the Catholics have folks out on the, out on the edge of uh, reality. And, 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 and so, the question so is on which side of the boundary we, we, are. We try to keep them out of drafting statements, but they are certainly in the streets more, more than we are. Well, I, I would often tell, I mean, and so all kinds came in, and not just Christian groups, but you know, over over the four years, and, and a dear friend in the audience had similar, even more complicated experiences than I did. But w when I would introduce uh, religious communities to policy experts, you know, they, we, sometimes we were the the locus of expertise, but most times we weren't. Uh, I, I would tell the groups coming in, if you're going to meet with the State Department's leading expert on the issue at hand you better get your facts right because if you if you come in either not knowing or misunderstanding it your ability to persuade that leader is, is minimal and it will evaporate very very quickly uh, and but you are absolutely right Brian even on the evangelical side there were people who knew the policy cold and were experts and, and, and understood this and then there were some who were, were less scrupulous about uh, having a deep understanding of the policy uh, but it is that, that unevenness that makes a lot of secular policy feel very nervous sitting down with, with uh, representatives of, of, of all kinds of religious groups, at least in my experience. So let's pivot to the audience. Uh, we, we have a microphone somewhere uh, here. So just raise your hand if you have a, have a question. So there uh, in, the, in the middle. And please tell us, tell us who you are. And, yeah, and I, I'm Edward Grant. I'm... Uh, uh, affiliated as a volunteer faculty with the uh, Pellegrino Center for Clinical Bioethics up at the medical school. Uh, and uh, I, I wrote a, a, a somewhat of an undergraduate thesis on John Courtney Murray. So I really have two questions, and, and one is uh, directed to Father Hare, and one is more general. Uh, my thesis took the position that uh, uh, Murray would not have taken a, 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 a uh, an approving view of Robert Bellis' theory of, of civil religion, and I'd just be interested in comments on that. Maybe Professor Loven can comment on that. But 
to uh, Father Hare re regarding the Little Sisters of the Poor case. I, I think it's clear that uh, um, uh, Murray uh, would not have viewed standing in front of the Supreme Court with placards and such as consistent with his view of public discourse having the taste of a dry martini. I think that's <laughs> how he put it once. Um, but uh, given what the legal issues were at stake, I, I think there's a strong case to be made that he would be fully endorsing the arguments that were made before the court, particularly in light of some of the jurisprudence that came out of the circuit courts, in particular the Seventh Circuit, in particular the uh, retired and unlamented uh, Judge Posner on the Seventh Circuit, that basically said to the Little Sisters, uh, your, you know, your argument about you know, your right, your, how you see your right of conscience is not is just not a valid argument. I mean, it, it, you know, you don't have even the theological basis for it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but he really did cross that line, and of course we've seen that now with questioning of various judicial nominees, uh, you know, dogma living deep within them and that, that sort of thing. So I, I, I just wonder if you'd have any, you know, thoughts on that, that, that courts have crossed the line. I think you mentioned that, that maybe Murray would have been more supportive of the at least getting rid of that uh, virus in our jurisprudence, uh, which the ultimate resolution of the case, at least for now, seems to have done. Okay, so the first question was to you, and the second one was to me. Well, I started off with you and then sort of drifted over to... <laughs> so. All right, okay, Whichever. I'll yeah. try and answer what you gave me. Thank you. Uh, uh, my, my point uh, was, to, was to articulate it in three steps, because I think each step had its own grounding, and then you had to put it together. On the, on the one hand, uh, I don't think Murray would have uh, risen to the occasion to speak about the inclusion of contraception as part of a health plan for the society. I mean, he, he, uh, Murray's position on contraception, I think, evolved also from we hold these truths up through the, the so-called Toledo talk, if you will, and it's, but even apart from that, I don't think he would have thought that was a prudent thing for the church to do. So first. Secondly, I do think he would have gotten his hackles up about making a church agency uh, an and agent of distribution of contraception given what's on the books of church teaching at the present time. I think he, he had a very strong sensitivity as I indicated, his second principle, once you define the bipolar structure of authority, on the church side, the principle is the freedom of the church. And he had a very expansive view of Gregory VII and what he did on that. So I think he would have protested that fact. Then you come to the third step, knowing that, if you will, you don't have any objection to step one, you do have an objection to step two, What's your total position going to be when the Congress is debating whether there'll be any health care plan or not? So I think Murray would have made his point about the freedom of the church. He would have tried to design uh, strategies to be as protective as possible. But I don't think he would have been willing to put the whole bill at stake, at least in the arguments of the Catholic Church, to put the whole health care bill at stake because he had objection to point two. That would be my, my judgment. He, he without... I think, that, I think that the, the, the thrust of that argument, though, was, was... The thrust of that argument, though, was not contraception, but, but abortion, really. Uh, I mean, no, as I, I don't remember think that it, argument. I don't think it was. Well, we could discuss it offline, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, all I know is that, what I yeah. read about the case. The yeah. case was about the contraceptive Well, mandate. I'm talking... Okay, you went, you went back to the enactment by Congress, which, you know... But anyway, we can talk about that offline. All right. Yeah, but thanks. Thank you. Robin, you want to comment on the, the Bella? There, so there, there was the, then also the question of what would uh, Murray have thought about Bella's civil religion argument. And I think he would have regarded it as fuzzy thinking of, of some kind or another. Uh, it, it be, it, and this is related to, to Brian's most important point about the, the two sources of authority. Uh, the whole idea of civil religion confuses the, those two things. 
and and important as what Bella has to say about uh, American society and history is is a sociological observation. It it it's a I think a poor basis on which to uh, to construct a, a public consensus. Yeah, I'll, I'll just stop at that point. All right, Leon, who, oops. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blind here. Okay, yeah, I know it. <laughs> I know the position. Uh, Brian, this is to you. Uh, just a comment, maybe helpful in the contraception uh, health care. Uh, is the um, Murray's article on selective CO. Uh, that it brings in a whole other factor. He, uh, he was no big defender of CO, but uh, conscientious objector, objection, but he did uh, insist that he wanted a public discussion of the issues and that whole selective CO uh, reading, uh, having to defend oneself, he was hoping would you know, allow a public discussion of the issues, particularly as we were warming up in Vietnam. So it, it, it might carry over that one of the measures in the uh, uh, contraception uh, debate is whether or not this is facilitating a public argument. It's not determinative, but it is another issue. Yeah, well, of course, uh, the, the interesting thing about that debate was that American law protects the pacifist. American law protects the person who says, I never will use force. American law does not protect the just war theory and its conclusions, namely that some uses of force are legitimate and some are not. So if you are a selective conscientious objector in that sense, you better go to Canada. And so and that, was, that was the difference. Uh, whether you think of the architecture I laid out as a selective conscientious objection, I think to some degree point two was that. But if he, my point really was that he had a style of working through issues that was discreet and careful and, and disciplined by the facts without losing the capacity for bringing a final normative judgment on complex issues. And so my sense is, in the end, if he wrote the bishop's statement on something like this, you would not end up thinking the bishops were willing to trash the whole health care debate on the basis of his objection on the freedom of the church. Probably just uh, something that you won't want to do here, but uh, was uh, uh, there's the uh, bipolar uh, universe that we live in. And then there are the four conspiracies. Uh, do you want to take that over into a foundation for interfaith activity? Do I want to take it where? I'm sorry. Uh, a foundation for interfaith activity, which is something that the theology department is working on around here. But... Yeah, of course, when, when Murray wrote about the consensus, uh, ecumenical life didn't really exist for Albrecht. He, he was talking about creeds at war, and he was trying to moderate it and make sense of it, he, he himself made shifts, as you know, uh, on the ecumenical question, on some moral questions, and on his, his wider discussion, uh, including on the question of natural law. The difficult part of the difficulty there, as Francisca indicated, is it's harder to make natural law work today than it would have been in, in spite of Niebuhr. Niebuhr's last book of his life was rethinking natural mm -hmm. law and thinking of it in more positive terms. But today there's religious pluralism and then there's deeper moral pluralism in the country. So the appeal to natural law is, is, is harder. Tom. A uh, question for Brian here. I'm Tom Reese from Religion News Service. Uh, what would you think that uh, John Courtney Murray would think of the Notre Dame solution uh, to the contraceptive mandate? My understanding is that Notre Dame told its insurance company, no, we don't want contraceptives. Uh, but the insurance company said, that's nice, but we're going to provide it anyway. 
Uh, what, if, if, that's my, if that's correct, my understanding, what, how would uh, John Courtney Murray respond to this uh, uh, solution? I'm not sure. I mean, it wasn't just Notre Dame that faced that. There were other agencies. If you were, you know, depending on, the, uh, Bob McElroy can help immensely with this. It was a choice of going self-insured as opposed to working through a secular insurance company. He might have appealed to go in that direction. That again would have been a sort of protective device for preserving a circle of freedom without projecting, see, in the end, I think the problem in the end was how you were seen on health care as a basic right in this society. And the question about whether you were willing to risk that on the basis of your objection, a legitimate objection, I think, but whether you were willing to use that as a veto on the whole process. Your point gets more into the administration of the question and the answers to that are multiple, if you will. Yeah, I mean, my point was that I, it seems that the Notre Dame solution is almost the best of all possible worlds because the institution yeah. is able to maintain its, uh, its moral position, uh, but the uh, uh, contraceptives are still yeah. made available to uh, the employees who, who want right. them. Right. It, it, the, the, the multiplicity of possible working out of this uh, makes it look like uh, the rainbow. I mean, it just, there are, there, there are so many that we would have to parse them out, I think, to make sense of them. This is a question for both you and uh, Brian, just a bit ago, kind of hinted at it. Uh, Francesca talked about the relationship between Niebuhr and, uh, and, and Murray, I wonder what they learn from one another. Uh, in, in his late writings, Niebuhr says, well, I learned something about uh, the social nature of humanity and the, the greater good that can be had from communities than I once thought. Are there other issues in which they learn from one another? Why don't you start? Uh, well, it, it, and Francesca it clearly has, has done the, the archival research that is is necessary for this, uh, so she she may want to comment as well. Uh, you know, I think biographically speaking, it, it, this conversation has pointed to some of the difficulties they had in learning from from each other. That Niebuhr was uh, not in the best of health through the whole late 1950s when this discussion was happening. Murray uh, undertook the silence on political questions that cut him out of some of the Santa Barbara discussions later. I think it's, it, you know, it's one of the tragedies of our uh, theological disciplines in the, in the, for the question in the future of public theology that that, that discussion was not able to be developed in a face-to-face -face way as, as well as it might have been. My own judgment about Niebuhr on that point is whether he learned it from Murray or the more general discussion that was going on is, is ex exactly what you say. Uh, a more positive appreciation of human community and uh, especially a more positive appreciation of the natural law tradition and, and what it could contribute uh, to, to the resolution of, of these kinds of questions. That too has something to do with the Second Vatican Council. So again, complicated relationships where, where Murray is sometimes influencing the political discussion directly and sometimes very indirectly through what the, what the council is doing. I'm always struck when I read uh, Niebuhr's criticisms of natural law going all the way back into the 1940s that much of what he criticizes was also, you know, uh, rethought in the context of the Second Vatican Council. So, 
So there, there's a very complex discussion going on here. And, and I think we're poorer today for the fact that those two people didn't get to hammer it out more directly with, with each other. I think it's unfortunate that the way Murray and Niebuhr are pictured is all based on Murray's response to Niebuhr in We Hold These Truths. And that was a question of both substance and tone. I wrote someplace that it was a pre-ecumenical statement where the classical Jesuit took the confused <laughs> Protestant to school. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think Murray would have done it in the same way. That's the first thing. The second thing is, if you look at that carefully, because I think there were two parts to the argument. Part of the argument was his critique of Niebuhr. Part of the argument was his positive statement. There was much in the positive statement that is lasting value. The critique of Niebuhr, I think, was when Murray was the controversialist. And and what Niebuhr had said, essentially, was that natural law is a classical example of Catholic rationalism. It's a kind of prideful statement that it is possible for the human mind not only can to develop principles, but to argue those principles down to the most concrete solution and say the concrete solution is universally valid. And Niebuhr's whole understanding of dialectical understanding and irony and all of that went wild. But I do think that the last statement by Niebuhr on natural law was interesting. The final point of this, of course, is that if you take Charlie Curran's article on, on uh, Murray in his book on Catholic social ethics, if you take uh, Curran's article, he essentially says, uh, two things as I understand it, but you better go home and check and see whether I've got this right. He essentially says, on the one hand, uh, you can't sustain Murray's treatment of natural law given modern philosophical epistemological arguments, that it is hard to sustain that. Now, Stan Hauerbach says it as a throwaway line, and I don't think that's very helpful. But Curran argues that you can't you, you can't sustain the underpinnings in American society for natural law. And secondly, that you need more theological penetration of the natural law argument. You need to join these. Murray, in one statement, answering a question, I think, after Vatican II, said theologians today call for more unity between the theological and philosophical argument. He acknowledged it, he never took it up, he never developed it. But Curran then comes back and says, but you've got to have a language that you can talk to the society that is not faith language. So that's the functional equivalent of natural law, I think. So it, it is a fairly complex uh, uh, picture out there. I think one undertold influence of Murray on Niebuhr was on religious freedom. It, leading up to the 1960 presidential race, the hackneyed sort of interestingly mainline and evangelical argument against a Catholic candidate was he's going to violate your religious freedom because Catholics think error has no standing and they're going to impose Catholicism. Uh, and I think Niebuhr at a sort of genetic level believed that. But it's interesting that in some of the political interaction or the interaction around Fund for the Republic, I think Niebuhr realizes, and he says somewhere, that you know, the Catholic Church is not your mm -hmm. grandfather's Catholic yeah. Church in America. That he saw the change coming where a, a Murray could say uh, that indeed there, there could be a form of religious freedom uniquely American, and that it was Catholic, truly Catholic. Well, my, well uh, Niebuhr and Bennett on Reformation yes, yes, Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And the, you know this from your book, a Reformation Sunday, they took the pulpit, both right. of them, and said that the election of a Catholic is no longer a threat to American right. society. That was a pretty radical statement in those days. That's right. And, and so the, the editorial stance of Christianity in crisis is not anti-Catholic. It's mm -hmm. pro-Kennedy, unlike the mm -hmm. Christian century uh, in Chicago, which remained anti-Catholic through the election. I believe that it was Bennett and Niebuhr's permission that then allowed a lot of mainline Protestants to vote Catholic, whereas you know a year before, 1959, right. they would have never, never conceived of doing that. Uh, well, we, we are out of time. Please join me in thanking our, our two panelists. <laughs>